This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, my name is Kate Neville and I'm a neuro-oncologist at Indiana University. And today I'm delighted to be talking to Linda Liao, professor and chair of the Department of Neurosurgery at UCLA, about her recent study and publication, Association of Autologous Tumor Lysate Loaded Dendritic Cell Vaccination with Extension of Survival Among Patients with Newly Diagnosed and Recurrent Glioblastoma, a Phase 3 Prospective Externally Controlled Cohort Trial, published in JAMA Oncology in November of 2022. Dr. Liao, thank you so much for being here today and talking with me. Thank you for having me. So I remember when this paper was published because the neuro-oncology community was at a national meeting and, you know, kind of wondering what this would mean. And we'll get to the details later. But since this paper has been published, I've had patients calling, emailing me, asking me about DC VaxL. And so for our listeners out there, what's the most important thing you think clinicians should tell patients when they call asking about this study? This was a phase three non-randomized prospective cohort trial, an autologous vaccine for brain cancer that has shown some promising results. However, it is not yet FDA approved, so it is not currently available in the U.S. outside of clinical trials. And, you know, and further clinical trials are, are ongoing using this agent. I think in order to better understand the results of the study, which we'll get to, we first need to go over some of the methods and design and how you analyze the results. So do you mind giving us some background on that? The study was initially designed as a phase three double-blinded randomized control trial with the crossover arm. However, as the trial was underway, we began to realize that because of the crossover arm, eventually about 90% of all patients received DCVAX, either at new diagnosis or at presumed recurrence. There were actually several patients that, you know, uh, subsequently were probably found to have pseudoprogression. So in the end, it was depletion of the placebo control arm. Therefore, before the trial was ever unblinded, a prospective statistical analysis plan was designed to compare overall survival in the newly diagnosed cohort and the recurrent glioblastoma cohort of patients who are treated with DCVAX with contemporaneous matched external control populations from control groups of other formal randomized clinical trials. Because I think because of the crossover and what we you know, essentially had were two groups of patients, one who got DCVAX early, you know, at new diagnosis, and one who got DCVAX at first recurrence. So those were kind of the two populations we were left with with this trial, and that's why it was controlled to external controls. So yes, it's not a randomized controlled trial, but that is the background of the methods of the study. The comparator trials that were chosen based on predetermined criteria and a broad liter search was conducted using these criteria, which included contemporaneous study time period, similar KPS and age groups, reported outcomes with overall survival and you know, various other criteria that, that are uh, listed in the paper. So based on that, there were five newly diagnosed studies that were chosen for the comparator population and 10 recurrent glioblastoma studies that were chosen for the comparator population for, for that group. And then our statisticians did do internal validation using various specificity and sensitivity analyses. So overall, that was the methodology of the study. And, you know, I'm aware of the limitations of uh, using external control populations. But given the uh, conduct of the trial and the uh, depletion of the placebo arm, we felt that this was a comparison that made sense and with its known limitations. I think that brings up an interesting topic that maybe is beyond the scope of our discussion today, but about using these externally controlled cohort populations in cancer research specifically because of, you know, some of the the reasons that you mentioned that the ethics behind not 
offering an intervention or ability to cross over for patients with cancer, especially patients with incurable cancers. Yeah, correct. You know, and at the time of the trial initiation, it was actually quite difficult to get patients to an enroll um, because patients don't want to be on the placebo arm. And so the crossover arm was placed to allow for that option, but retrospect the comparators for, for this trial. With that, could you please review the most important results of your study? I think the most important results of the study are that the patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma receiving DCVAX had a median overall survival of 22.4 months from the time of surgery, you know, 19 months from the time of randomization. And the patients with recurrent GBM had a median overall survival of 13.2 months. And these survival statistics compared favorably with that of the external control populations from over 1,300 newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients and 640 recurrent glioblastoma patients from various other published clinical trials. But what I think maybe even more interesting is the long tail end of the survival curve and some of the subgroup analysis results that came out of the trial. For instance, the median survival of the MGMT methylated patients was over 30 months with an almost 20% five-year survival. What was you know, interesting is that the majority of these patients surviving over five years are surviving without recurrence, which in the field of glioblastoma is actually quite unusual. So, so I think it does give us some information and data in terms of how to design future clinical trials and perhaps how to stratify patients for immunotherapy trials and potential biomarkers. Yeah, I found that particularly interesting to the different subgroup analyses and the MGMT group specifically, which we know in general is a subgroup of patients with glioblastoma who in general we expect to live longer and have longer progression-free survival than patients who do not have MGMT promoter methylation present or have an, what we call an unmethylated MGMT status sometimes. But obviously more of a benefit you found in your study in that group of patients who received DC Vaxel. But I was curious if you had hypothesized a mechanism of or a physiologic, you know, kind of pharmaceutical reason why or why the vaccine might work better for patients who had MGMT methylated tumors. DC Vax is an autologous dendritic cell based vaccine that consists of a combination of a patient's own dendritic cells, which are antigen presenting cells that are cultured from blood cells from the patient's blood. And then we put that in combination with a tumor lysate uh, from the patient's tumor that is taken at the time of surgery. And the concept is that the dendritic cell or antigen presenting cell is able to phagocytize and process tumor antigens from the tumor. And then the cell combination is injected back into patients to activate endogenous T cells. And we have shown from previous preclinical and early clinical trials that the use of dendritic cell vaccination with autologous tumor lysates does induce proliferation or infiltration of T cells into brain tumors, which we think is the initial first step for induction of an immune response in in these uh, brain cancer patients. One problem with immunotherapy for glioblastoma is that glioblastomas tend to be immunologically cold. There are no T cells in the tumor, so that's why a lot of these checkpoint inhibitors and other immunomodulators don't work as a single agent. So by activating the immune response using a vaccine, we're hoping that getting the T cells into the tumor will allow for kind of that initiation of immunotherapeutic response. Yeah, really interesting. And I guess this would probably be a good time to, if you don't mind, just in really kind of basic terms, explaining what exactly the DC VAXL is and how it works. 
The DC Vax L is a dendritic cell vaccine, and the L stands for lysate. <laughs> so the dendritic cells are antigen presenting cells. They're actually uh, normal antigen presenting cells in the body, but we've uh, developed a way to actually grow them in, in large quantities outside of the body from uh, t- taken from uh, progenitor blood cells. And these antigen presenting cells are then co cultured with tumor lysate from patients' tumors. The concept behind is that because of the relative immune privilege of the brain, the dendritic cells circulating around do not typically encounter tumor antigens within the brain. So this is just a way to basically get the dendritic cells together with the tumor antigens. And then that itself is a vaccine that's injected back into patients to activate the endogenous T cells. And it's the activated T cells that traffic and migrate into the tumors to uh, initiate an immune response. And that we have found in, you know, in our previous preclinical and and early clinical studies, that is something that DCVAX can do. It does induce the trafficking of T cells into brain tumors. So we were talking earlier, obviously, about the methods and design of the study and the externally controlled cohort. And we talked about that as one of the potential limitations of the study. In addition to that, any other limitations or challenges that you encountered conducting this study? The patients treated with DCVAX in the study were compared with the control arms of contemporaneous matched external controls who receive standard of care alone. To mitigate some of the limitations using external controls, we did use a novel methodology uh, to neuro-oncology called a MAKE analysis, which stands for Matching Adjusted Indirect Comparison Analysis, which matched patient characteristics between the trials as best we could at the population level. However, we were unable to obtain individual patient-level data from the previously published comparator trials, so we're not able to do individual patient matching, which we are all aware is a current limitation with the use of external controls. So I'm actually hoping that our publication uh, and the discussions around it will spur the sponsors of these clinical trials to publicly release their individual patient data so that we as a field can further innovate and get regulatory interest in the use of external control arms in neurology and oncology trials. Because for patients with a a deadly diagnosis, I think there's less and less interest in being the placebo control arm uh, for, you know, for large randomized controlled trials, especially since the data of, of standard of care is actually pretty well known from trials that we've done over the past 10 to 15 years. On that note, for the individual patient data, how detailed would the data be? I think even things that contain the typical prognostic indicators, age, extent of resection, MT methylation, doesn't necessarily need to be terribly complex because quite frankly, we actually don't don't have very many prognostic indicators in the glioblastoma field. But I think it'll open up a way to really get patient level data. And I think the FDA is becoming more open to the use of external controls as the comparator arm for large clinical trials. So how do you foresee these results potentially impacting patient care in the future? I think for next steps for DC Vaxel, based on what we've learned about the mechanisms of action and the potential biomarkers of response, we are currently conducting additional studies to look at the combinations of DC vaccines with various immune checkpoint inhibitors and immune modulators. So we can help to further enhance the efficacy because even though there does seem to be a signal of efficacy with a almost 20% five-year survival rate, that still means 75 to 80% of people aren't living five years. So I think we as a field need to do better. I think there's not going to be a one magic bullet that cures glioblastoma, but having different options available to patients for real-world studies of rationalized, personalized immunotherapy, I think would be useful for the field. So given the very favorable toxicity profile for DCVAX and its potential efficacy, I do hope that it can be FDA approved someday and incorporated into testing various combinations, if not, you know, standard of care in the future if, if these subsequent trials pan out. So on that note, do you foresee DCVAX-L 
being in a combination randomized controlled trial study looking at DC Vaxel with a different agent or another study with temozolomide in a randomized controlled trial setting? You know, one problem with a lot of randomized controlled trials is that it itself is also artificial compared to the real world use of a lot of our therapies. So whether I foresee another randomized controlled trial, I think it depends on the the sponsor uh, of the trial. But I think if we are able to get these options out to the community for testing, I'm hoping that there will be greater data that we can generate. Because I think one of the problems we have with a lot of these clinical trials of, of single agents is that without access uh, to, to the agents, it's hard for people to do these combination studies. So I'm hoping that there will be innovation in the field in terms of how we can best move some treatments forward, given the current regulatory as, as well as, you know, clinical trial environment that kind of limits, you know, how we do larger trials with combination therapies. So patients sometimes, especially since the publication of your paper, they call it and they ask, they understand that this is not an FDA approved therapy, but how can they access DC VAXL right now? Is that information you can share with us? Could you talk to that a little bit? DC VAXL is currently available for compassionate use in the UK. It was approved by the uh, MHRA for that purpose. It's, it's not yet FDA approved. And I think in terms of access to treatments, there's the balance between access and also getting more data and validation of, of efficacy. And I, I hope there will be a way future to be able to do both, you know, to be able to allow patients access to treatments. And then I have the neuro-oncology community continue to test agents and come up with innovative trials to, you know, prove or, or disprove efficacy. You know, one problem is that unless you can get access to the agent, it's very difficult to do that. So perhaps a way to open access to DC Vax for continued testing would be beneficial to the field. Absolutely. And speaking just on a broader scope, patient access to medications is such a big issue in many fields of medicine, cancer care included, with insurance and approvals, let alone access to things that are not approved for compassionate use or, you know, experimental trial use. It's a challenge, but I appreciate your comments and you being so candid about it. You know, a lot of patients now in the neuro-oncology community, they're just taking a lot of different (laughs) off-label drugs that have even less proof of efficacy for (laughs) for glioblastoma, but it's FDA approved for another indication and and they want to try it. And, you know, and neuro-oncologists are giving it. I guess my hope for DC Vax is that maybe it could be accessible so that we, we can do these studies and allow patients the right to try. Thank you so much, Linda, for joining me and answering my many questions and the dialogue about your study and DC Vaxel and the challenges surrounding cancer clinical trial design. I really appreciated our conversation today. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. Thank you for listening and for letting us join you on your commute while you're exercising or even while you're brushing your teeth. This has been another episode of the Neurology Podcast, your best source of practical, relevant, and timely information for neurologists, clinicians, and patients. The views and opinions of the participants in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the journal Neurology or the AAN. Disclosures of the participants are included in the show descriptions reached by a link on the neurology.org website.